who brings us the message. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Hey, it is great to be with you tonight, um, and boy, isn't the Lord kind to give us this evening after the rain, and uh, he's also going to encourage us to end on time, because there's another storm coming, so uh, he has taken care of everything tonight. Um, we're so thankful. I hope you had a great uh, July 4th weekend last week, uh, whatever your plans were. We had a good group here, but obviously more of you are back, and so we're so thankful to see you tonight. Uh, I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer, so would you join me? Let's pray. Father, it is good to be with your people. It's good to be out here on the lawn, and God, we do praise you for the way that you have protected and provided for us uh, this past week. We thank you, God, that you are aware of our lives. Even things we're unaware of, you are, and you're good. So God, I pray tonight that we would uh, be taught by your word, God, that it would impact us deeply, and uh, that we would not be the same because of it. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen. If this is your first time, we're so glad you're here, uh, and if you are here for the first time and feel brave enough to raise your hand and wave at us, could you do that? Awesome, we got people right here down front, right here, oh, hey brother, good to see you. This is excellent. Well, um, we're going to come find you right at the end, and we have a gift for you, and thank you so much for coming and joining us. Uh, this is uh, Evangelical Free Church of Elgin. We are uh, on the lawn, amen? Here we are. And, uh, and I got to tell you, what a great privilege to uh, visibly represent to everybody who's driving by uh, the body of Christ at a really unusual time. So, so thankful we could do that. Uh, my sermon title, again, comes from the book of James tonight, and we are in a series uh, really dealing just with chapter 1, and, uh, and God has so much that He wants to teach us out of that. If you have your Bible, you can open up to James chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 9, uh, probably more through 11. I think verse 12 is going to be its own sermon next week, uh, but, uh, so if I don't get there, don't feel like you got gypped. It was on purpose. Um, but I want to talk about, uh, the, my sermon title is Don't Fade. And what do I mean by that? Um, don't let your life blow away because you based it on the wrong things, thinking that your substance and your value and even your identity as a believer has something to do with what you own, possess, or a position that you have. Uh, and I, I, that seems like a very simplistic message, but I tell you what, it is right in the middle of American Christianity. Would you agree? Um, and it, I think of all the different places we could know Christ in this world, uh, we happen to live in a place where we have much. And, uh, and so our identity is very easily captured by things that do not have substance. Um, how many of you saw the movie Mary Poppins growing up? Just raise a hand. A spoonful of sugar helps the... Oh, so many wonderful folks tonight. Um, I won't sing it, but uh, I remember the first time I saw that as a small boy. And it happened that uh, that scene where uh, Mr. Banks is looking for a new nanny. And the advertisement goes out. And so all of a sudden, out in front of Mr. Banks' house is all these English nannies. And they're all got the same exact attire, and whatever it means to be a nanny, you know that's an English nanny, and so they're all waiting for the interview, but do you remember what happens? The wind comes up, and to the delight of anybody who ever watched it, and certainly I remember as a boy, I just started chuckling as the wind began to pick up English nannies and blow them down the street, and they just began to blow away, you know, very proper with their arms stiff and umbrellas up, and then they just blew down the street, and I thought, that's awesome, that's hilarious. Um, and it's great theater, but it's a sad image if it's speaking of your life, amen, that there is nothing to you, that you have based your worth and your identity on inconsequential things. In fact, so what happens is that 
what would be scary is if I was just talking about people who didn't know God, but this passage is written to believers. And how sad to be people who know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but to have so got it wrong as your perspective of yourself that when the trials that God has promised us come, you simply fade. Your worth, your value, your identity, your very placement in the situation that you are, instead of being there and being effective for Christ, you are drawn away. And it's very possible that that can happen. Um, and so the Apostle James writes to a bunch of Christians who would be very tempted to think wrongly about themselves because of the persecution they were going in and through. Uh, and, and you see that. And what's interesting in the book of James, how many of you know what a paradox is? You know what a paradox is? You got an idea of a paradox? It's certainly something that seems contradictory on the surface or the first time that you hear it. A guy by the name of G.K. Chesterton once said that a paradox is the truth standing on its head waving for attention. And James, the apostle, is the absolute king of the paradox. He says things that on the surface don't make a lot of sense, or at least they frustrate us. How about this one? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when your life is awful. Now, doesn't that sound like good common sense? Rejoice, you're in pain. Rejoice, it's hard. And you, we say, okay, that doesn't make surface sense. James twists the thing around. Certainly in our world, self-sufficiency is sort of the idol, certainly in America, that we all can worship so easily. And he says that the wisest person is not the person who knows everything. It's the person who never stops asking God for everything. The one who lacks wisdom knows it and continually comes to God seeking it. That is the wise person. Well, just like he twists and kind of moves things around to get our attention, you come to this passage and he has a few doozies. And it starts with this one, and I want to talk to you about him tonight. I'd like to tell you about the rich poor man. Now, does that seem contradictory? How can you be a rich poor man? I mean, if you're poor, you're poor. Well, listen to what he says in verse 9. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. And you say, how can that be possible? After all, you are whatever it means to be somebody of humble circumstances. Well, that word, you know, when you look into the Greek, it really means lowly. You are of lowly circumstances. And, and if I flesh that out, it means that you are not much materially and you are not much socially. You do not have much in this world of wealth and you are not highly regarded at all. You are officially a brother or a person of humble circumstances, lowly, beggarly. Uh, and he's really trying to capture the heart of who he wrote this book for. Uh, remember, this went out to Jewish believers who, for their sake of following Jesus Christ, had been kicked out of Jerusalem and now were living in foreign places and cities in which they did not grow up without the means that they once had, and they can't even lead, lean into their nationalistic identity or go hang out with the other Jewish people because they've lost all that for the sake of Christ. They are now without much and not thought of as much. That's a rough position to be in. Um, maybe you're here tonight and you feel that. Maybe you're like, I... I can identify with not having... How many of you can at least identify with wanting more? Come on, testify, you pagans. No, I mean, I said that in love. Seriously, our heart, we like... Somebody here tonight is broke. Somebody here tonight is facing hardship, and your, your heart kind of can identify with this. And, and even the idea of not being thought of much as far as socially status or or important in some way that you think you should be. And yet, James has the audacity to say, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory, literally brag, in his high position. What's he doing there? 
Well, he's rewriting the framework of which we think, and he's saying your worth and your value has absolutely nothing to do with your paycheck. Now, everybody say amen. You are not what you make. You are not where you live. You are not the color of your skin, and I'm not downgrading that at all. I am saying that all surface, all external, all of these things upon which you say, this is my value, he's saying, no, you're the glory in your high position. What is that? It's simply this. You know Jesus Christ personally. And that is the end of the story on your value. Anybody say amen to that? He's saying you need to glory in your high position. Think about this. You don't have to raise your hand to this. Do any of you feel like you are so unknown in this world, and if you weren't here tomorrow, nobody would notice? So that's a sad place. Do you know how many people in the body of Christ struggle with deep loneliness and not mattering? There are people who come into churches all the time, and they see us, and hey, we're a church that's been blessed with many long-term relationships, and they come in, and, and, and they feel like, I don't have that. I don't know that. You don't know the story of my family. Maybe you come from an absolutely fractured family. Maybe you feel like your identity isn't much at all. And, uh, and, and you say, how can I glory in my, my high position? Well, think about this. You may have no pedigree or anything externally that says, I should know you. But can I tell you, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, knows your name. The one who framed everything around you has his eye locked in on you if you are his child. If you have been saved by him, he knows everything that happened to you this week and cares about it more than you do. Your identity is attached to that relationship with him. You think about this. Some of you, how many of you would renovate your house if you could? How many of you would like a little more floor space? How many of you would like upgrade your countertops? Come on, somebody, testify. Uh, just what's the perk? You know, we all have this thing about if I have, or maybe, maybe you uh, uh, came tonight and you're not in a house. No, you live in a rental, and that's hard. And, and you, you have struggled financially. Maybe you're not living in the place you wanted to live because of something that happened. Well, friends, if we wanted to get real impoverished, I'd take you all down to Haiti with me. Where 14 of us would live in one room. And from the minute the lights went out, there's no electricity. And we would sit in the dark through the night with no air and nothing to comfort us until the light of the sun came on in the morning. And that would be our existence. So if wherever you are on the spectrum and whatever you think of yourself, can I also tell you this? If you are a Christian, you possess heaven itself. Because heaven is to know Jesus Christ and to be his, in his presence. So when you think of this, how can you glory in your high position? Friend, you own what is beyond anything in this world. Is that good news to anybody? That's yours. And no one can take that away from you. That's so powerful. Um, what do I mean by this? I'll tell you this. I'm looking at you, whether you think I'm looking at you or not. I'm looking at you right in the eyes. You are the most exalted, broke person I have ever met in my life. Amen? You are the most miserable billionaire I've ever met. You know, you are the most unexpected. And I'm not up here just being funny. You are a child of the king of glory. And no one can take that from you. A thing that you could never earn and no one has ever deserved is yours for eternity. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the salvation we have all received. But listen to this. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. When I was a kid, I grew up close to Los Angeles. And uh, talk about a place where there's a pecking order. And uh, I don't know if you've ever, you've seen this in a movie or maybe you've experienced this. Have you ever heard of a restaurant you knew you could never get reservations to? 
basically because you don't roll in that crowd and you don't have that kind of dough. And, and honestly, there are places that in order for you to somehow have reservations for that place, you would have to make something of an amazing amount. You would have to be someone of amazing importance for you to ever get reservations there. I, John Duncan, have a table in heaven. Oh yeah, I roll that way. Do you know what's going on here? You're like, that's so silly. I'm ruining the illustration. I know that, but you're not going to forget it now. Christian, your spot is reserved at the marriage supper of the Lamb and it will be a party that never ends. Who's excited for that? But do you think of yourself that way? Do you base your joy on that truth? Do I? Or are you forever pining after a better experience in this lifetime to somehow make you feel like you're worthwhile? This is what the apostle is trying to do. He's trying to take these folks and go, you who have little should be glorying. In fact, that's your position. That's who you are. Then it says, here's your boast. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, to literally boast in it. Friends, there are things that you should never boast in, but this is one that you get to boast in. It's this, that I can, I, we all want to show off what we've done and and what we have. But I got to tell you, they will never sing the song, To John Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. It doesn't go that way. Amen? And there's nothing in you that should be in that verse. But there's this man named Jesus who died for you. Amen? And to him be the glory, great things he has done. And literally, our boast should be such that God has done this in our life. In fact, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, The Lord says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. But let him who boasts, boasts of this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things. Friends, we so live in the celebrity culture. Do you agree with me? We are all about the somebodies. And, and frankly, with all that's going on, don't some of the somebodies just irritate you? I know I need to repent of that. But it's just like, come on, you know. People with, but, but, but we're all about who you know and everything. But when you walk into the church, it should be an absolutely different experience. This is why the church is not a country club, and it's not like anything else in the world. Why? Because I walk, when you walk into the church, the least impressive person is the guy preaching. And that's not a, oh, poor me, I'm terrible. No, I, I think I, way more than I should of myself. But understand this, when you walk in, this is literally what it could be like for Christians. We walk in the door and we're like, oh, did, did you see who's here? Hugh McGowan is here. That, have you met him? Jesus Christ died for that guy. Amen? You get his autograph afterwards. He's going to love that. Let's go up. Sign it. No, I, you're like, that's just going, no. Friends. Every person in this place, value and worth and identity has been taken beyond the stratosphere of any of the ridiculousness that this world can come up with. And our valuing of one another changes when we stop looking at what you own, what you wear, what you look like, who you talk to, how you talk, and anything other. I have one question. Does Jesus Christ know you? then you are worth me laying down my life for you. You are worth me sacrificing to know you. You are someone of immensity and mattering. And frankly, here's the fun news, friends. For the rest of your eternal existence, you will be the party that is celebrated in heaven to the glory of Jesus Christ. Does that change the way you think about you? 
is it changed the way we think about us. Hugely important. And here's the final thing, and this is sort of the sideway thing, and, and this is something that we need to understand, is because if you can see these things and you can see your boast, can you also see the blessing of this? Friends, if you are here tonight, and as far as the standards of our society go, you are impoverished. And there's not enough in your bank account. And frankly, it's been a hard year. And you're carrying debt. And you don't have your act together. And you put on a nice show when you walk in, but it is really tight. Did you know something? And this is where we're all going to get uncomfortable. Because we live in a land where we all have a lot and we all like to gauge where we all are. But let me just talk to you. Whatever you think about the struggle going on in your life, can I tell you this? You are blessed. You are blessed. And I'm going to tell you why you're blessed. Here's the reason you're blessed. Because you do not have to wade through your riches to discover that you need Jesus. We are in a culture that is so hard after financial security and make it the basis of our evaluating people around us as if it is some sort of determiner of their worth. Frankly, friends, your wallet means nothing about what you mean to Jesus Christ. In fact, your wallet may be getting in the way of you and Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to become real popular. What you need to understand is that when we go down this status journey, we are in danger. Here's something that you need to know. Guess what? I will not be a pastor in heaven. Is that news to you? Whatever you are and wherever you work and whatever you've done, you won't be that in heaven. Frankly, that will stop being you. What is your identity in this moment? What's it based on as far as this world's concerned? Well, I'm a mom. I'm a, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm a grandma. I do this. You know, I, I'm an, a, an attorney. I'm a, I'm, a, I, I'm a worker at this factory. This is who I am, and this is what I do. I'm not saying those things are meaningless. I'm just saying you won't be one in heaven. I read a great story this week, and uh, it was literally, there was a guy, he's a four-star general, and he had to go to this social for the town that he lived in, and somebody put him next to the pastor at dinner. And so they're sitting there at dinner, and the what do you say to a pastor? You're a general. And so he leans over, he goes, uh, Pastor, why don't you tell me something of heaven? And this is the pastor's reply. Well, the first thing you need to know is that in heaven you will not be a general. No one will ever ask you what you made in heaven. Somebody say amen to that. Some of you are feeling uncomfortable because you've actually made some money. We'll get to you. And by the way, friends, let me tell you something that I believe. We just talked about the rich, poor man. Now I'd like to talk about us. Because we live in a place, and I am not downplaying the pain and the struggle. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. You go through trials, amen? Your wallet will never have anything to do with trials. Trials are part of your life, not because of what you make, but it's because who saved you. Christ promises that he's going to take us through difficulty. It doesn't matter, and that's James' whole point. He's trying to actually get you to stop thinking about money. But we have a struggle in doing that. He's saying, no, that is not what this is built on. That's not the important point. But you have to acknowledge this, friends. Poverty is a spiritual advantage. Poverty is a spiritual advantage. Whether you think so or not, the fact is that our poverty and our struggle have inclined our hearts to God, to the instant recognition that I'm not enough. Let me tell you one of the biggest struggles of being a, an American living in this place at this time, for which I am so deeply grateful. Anybody else? Praise God for it, is that you think you don't need Jesus. And somehow you're sufficient. And somehow you can build a world where all of that stuff doesn't intersect with your spiritual life. But we cannot ignore the God of heaven who said, I came to preach the good news to the poor. 
I came to preach to the people who recognized that they needed me. And so if you see this rich poor man, let's look at the last verses and let's see the poor rich man. Yeah, here's an impoverished wealthy person. And obviously we're still talking about spiritual things. Look at what it says. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. How many of you have ever seen a rich man be happy about being humiliated? Is that a common occurrence? No, usually you see him pretty ticked off about that. Because wealth tends to be something where it's all about sufficiency. For the sun rises and with a scorching wind and withers with the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed, so too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. You have to understand that the position of anyone that you would think in your mind, oh, that's a wealthy person, is absolutely no different from anyone else. Before Jesus Christ, we all stand on the same level playing field. It doesn't mean that riches are not real and poverty is... No, I'm saying that the poorest person on this planet is just as desperately in need of Jesus Christ as the most wealthy individual you will ever meet. Amen? There is no difference whatsoever. But somehow the lie of our enemy is that there is. And he wants you to believe it. He wants you to believe that. Friends, you're, we're only one step away from facing the reality of who we are. Uh, several years ago, Hurricane Katrina hit. And I took a team of uh, college students, and we went down to Waveland, Mississippi. And when we got to Waveland, they took us down to what they were calling the ground zero of that place. And literally, for about a mile in off the shore of Wayland, Mississippi, there was nothing. The trees were gone. Everything was gone. The only thing left were cement slabs where homes used to be. And we spent a weekend just serving food. And I'll never forget, I was standing there in the serving line, and a man came through, and it was apparent, even under those conditions, that he was homeless. He obviously was homeless before this had ever happened. In fact, he knew the whole routine pretty well. Walked in, and, and he was literally like acting like a tour guide for all the other people who didn't know how to do this. And the guy right behind him was wearing what obviously used to be a very expensive outfit. And I heard them, and these two guys start talking. I'm literally serving food. And this guy behind him a few days ago, was one of the wealthiest men in Waveland, Mississippi. He owned three luxury restaurants that literally hung over the ocean water. He was a multi, multi, multi-millionaire, and in one fell swoop, he had nothing, and he found himself standing in a line talking to a man he most likely would have never had a conversation with. Amen? Sometimes reality is stark. You will never own anything outside of Jesus that will change your status. Amen? The problem is, and you're like, this is a fun one, Pastor John, I know, is that many of us are missing out on joy and perspective in why God saved us and what he is doing, and we are constantly being drawn into this struggle of thinking that somehow your worth and your value are attached to these things. No, if anything, James sits there and says, and oh, by the way, if any of you survive this kerfuffle and you happen to be a person of means, don't let it skew your thinking. Friends, by the way, there is no indictment of the rich here. There's no, you're a bad Christian because you have means. No, you're a poor Christian if you don't understand that they have nothing to do with your value or your worth. Only Jesus Christ matters. What is this saying? That worldly wealth is temporal. It's really based on Isaiah 40, which talks about the grass withering and the flowering fading, and, the, and, and God's word remains forever. But riches, they are just such a temporal thing. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow. So what is the boast of the person who has means? And frankly, what should be the boast of American church? Should it be our building? I'm asking, should it be our building? 
How about our website? Pastor, this should be true. Why? Because not one of them can hold up and not one of them have anything to do with our work. And if we ever elevate any of them, you know who we lose? We lose people who need to know Jesus Christ. Amen? The world is stuck. It thinks that joy can only happen when you have your settled financial plan and, and your health is stable and, and you've risen to a place in society where you're respected and you have certain things about yourself. And, 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 and one of the things that's going on in our American society right now is that if you are a born-again Christian who believes that Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation and that all personal identities are defined by the God of heaven and no one else, guess what? You're not popular. Do we worship popularity? We also don't try to be idiots, okay, by the way? Amen. Friends, our challenge as a church, is to never make uh, our security and our hope in our status as far as the world is concerned. It must be in Jesus Christ. We must lift high the name of Jesus Christ, and it has to be the determiner of all that we do. In fact, the big kicker of this is that, like I said before, it doesn't matter what's in your wallet. You're going to go through trials. Say amen to that. It does not matter, friends. Some of us think that somewhere over the rainbow, there's no trials. I know you're right. Guess what's over the rainbow? Heaven. And until you get there, things will be tough. Why? Because God is glorified in dependent people. Consider the fact that the biggest idol in our country is self-sufficiency. And when we let that happen in the church, the poor man has forgotten his boast. The rich man has forgotten his boast. There is one boast. His name is Jesus. You can say amen to that. That is what we boast in. So what is the takeaway here? Friends, it is a total heart takeaway. This is not an indictment over what you make or what you do as a job. The question is, where is your identity found? Because until it is anchored only in Jesus Christ, your joy is up for grabs all the time. You have nothing to anchor into because it's all built on who you are and what you've done. Scripture's not lying when it says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it is a hard thing to believe with all your heart that who I am in Christ is what matters most. But that's what we got to do. And our challenge is to avoid the temptation of depending upon our means for our identity or our joy. I I'll close with this. We went up to Lake... How many of you have been up to Lake Geneva? Isn't, I thought it's such a pretty place. I was there years ago, but I had kind of forgotten that it was really cool. So we went up there and our family, and we were going to spend the day at the lake. It was going to be one of those let's go to the beach kind of experiences. And uh, we had been talking about where we were going to do it. And, and we decided, and, and we really decided because I'm a cheapskate, that once I found out you had to pay to go to the beach, I, well, that's a bummer. I didn't pay to go to the beach. But anyway, Right across from the beach in the little harbor inlet there, have you ever walked through that park where the creek goes through? I would highly recommend it. So what we did is we took our hammocks and we took our, uh, our little picnic basket and, and, and we went on the cheap trail and, uh, and we go down and we park, we park in this park. And I just got to tell you this, it was awesome. It was so much fun. This creek is just flowing. It's never more than like two feet deep. I'm sitting in it. I'm getting attacked by my children. They're having fun. I don't have to babysit. It was wonderful, you know, just, just glorious. And we're having all this fun. And then I noticed there's all these other families showing up. And so I had to go back to the car to get something. And when I went back out to the car, I looked down on the beach there in Lake Geneva. Can I tell you, I don't think social distancing, it, it doesn't exist there. 
I mean, there were just, it was like wall-to-wall bodies at the beach. And I got to tell you, it was so hot. And they're all like crammed together like sardines. And they're sweltering in the heat. And they paid to do it. And as silly as this sounds, I was sitting there going, oh, those poor folks. Those poor people. And that may sound ridiculous, and you've probably gone to that beach. No, you're a Christian and God loves you. That's wonderful. No, no application that way. But I will tell you this. God gives great joy on the basis of his son. Amen? There's something inside our souls and of our flesh that says you have to pay to get there. And you have to be to be joyful. You have to have a certain amount of security to somehow have joy. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. Amen? That's hard to live out. It doesn't mean that your trials are not painful. But Christian, Christ knows your name. You've got a seat reserved in heaven. It's got your name on it. It's for all eternity. And whatever you're going through, you have the immeasurable riches of Jesus Christ. Good news? And by the way, <laughs> it's so hard to talk about this. We're so sensitized to, to money, but I'm going to say it anyway. The least amount of income on this lawn in Jesus is richer than the most wealthy person in this entire community. Amen? You are a child of God. The most wealthy person on this lawn, because of his knowledge of Jesus Christ, is just as wealthy. But now we get to be brothers. Now I get to know you. And you get to be my friend. And I don't have to be afraid of what I make or what you make because Jesus Christ has made us one body. Amen? By the way, (laughs) the only thing that God will care about in this life of our monetary resources is what we did for it, with it, for the kingdom of heaven. Nothing else. He will not care how much you had. He will care what you depended upon him with. There's like eight more sermons in here, so I'm going to pray now. Let's pray. Oh God, it's hard to talk about this. The world has so messed with our heads. God, we know you. And somehow knowing you sets us free. I do pray because God, there's not one picture here tonight of life that is exactly the same as the other. But we do know this, that God, no matter the means of our lives, no matter the trials of our lives, you want us to give us, to give us yourself. You want to give us more of Christ. You want us to be satisfied in you, and you want us to be secure in you, not looking over our shoulder, but truly being a body. Would you do that, Lord? Would you do that? And we'll give you the glory in your name. Amen. Would you stand, and um, as we close our service, it's called this song called, My Worth is Not in What I Own. Sing this song with conviction. 